what's up? My name is Katie and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a catch up wrap up. Basically, I have not done a wrap up since October. So it's been a while and I need to catch up wrapping up all of these books. The reason that I haven't done a wrap up is because from November to December into the beginning of January, I was reading solely Cassandra Clare books. I was on a Shadowhunters kick and since in a wrap up, you can't really go into detail about each book because you don't want to spoil it. I just felt like there really wasn't like a point to just wrapping up one series. I'm going to be wrapping up all the books I read in November, December, and January. So you're in for a treat. It's a bit of a doozy. There's many books on this wrap up. So you know, we'll see how it goes, but I think it's going to be a fun time. First off, starting in November, November was a very Shadowhunters month. I basically finished up the back half of the Mortal Instruments series consisting of City of Fallen Angels, City of Lost Souls, and City of Heavenly Fire. In the Mortal Instruments, we follow Clary Frey, whose life is turned upside down when she discovers that she is a shadow hunter descended from the angels. They hunt demons. In the back half of the Mortal Instruments series, Clary Frey and the rest of the shadow hunters of the New York Institute are reeling from the events of the Mortal War. All is not at peace as shadow hunters begin turning up murdered all over New York City. Jace is pulling away from Clary with no explanation at hand and there are dark forces brewing. All is not as it seems. I ended up giving this book four out of five stars. I think that this volume in particular dragged a little bit, but overall I just have fun every single time I read this series. Sometimes in this book in particular, the characters fell a little flat and didn't get the time that they needed to be developed into more three-dimensional characters. For example, I felt like Alec didn't really get the character development he deserved in this book. I felt like he fell a little bit flat in this one and also in the next one, City of Lost Souls and I end up loving him in later books, but in these beginning books, I just don't really like see his full character. I'm glad that he got fleshed out later, but I do feel like that is lacking a little bit in this book, but where there are other characters that are really fleshed out, like Clary and Jace, and especially Simon and Izzy in, in this book and in the back half of the trilogy in particular, I really enjoy that we get more attention to them as characters and seeing how they grow with the situations at hand. And of course, this book had a very dramatic ending, which made me want to read. City of Lost Souls, which I picked up immediately after. These two books I tabbed only for their connections to the Infernal Devices because the back half of the Mortal Instruments and the Infernal Devices were staggered in their release dates, so the books connect to each other and we start to get subtle hints as how these characters are all connected, so that's really great. I ended up giving City of Lost Souls 4.5 out of 5 stars. I thought that the villain was so evil and like just a really compelling villain and I do feel like the character arcs did improve a lot in this book as compared to the previous one and the plot kept me reading because it was so twisty turny and it went to some interesting places that we haven't been before in Shadowhunters books so I thought it was really interesting and I love when Cassandra Clare changes up her settings because I think that she always comes up with these creative new places for the Shadowhunters to go and it always leads to really exciting plots. And finally, we have City of Heavenly Fire, the last in all of the Mortal Instruments series, book number six, and I gave this one five out of five stars. If there is one thing that Cassandra Clare's knows how to write, it is a conclusion. Her conclusions are always just so fast-paced, incredible, there's a lot of things going on. I felt, especially in City of Heavenly Fire compared to City of Glass, which closed out the first half of the Mortal Instruments, the consequences and the stakes were so incredibly high and it just made everything just feels so real. I just love like the action in it, the angst that the characters have to go through. I also feel like by this book there were certain things about characters that annoyed me. Like I always felt like Clary was so reckless and maybe that's because I'm not 15 anymore and she is 15, 16. Jace is like very broody and sometimes these things would annoy me about the characters but I've come to realize when reading this book that those characterizations were very purposeful and like Clary is made headstrong and reckless and makes these bad decisions because that's how Cassandra Clare wanted her to be. She didn't want her to be like this perfect heroine. Like she definitely does things that sometimes make me very frustrated in the books, but I think that's part of her nuanced character that she's not just like this perfect little shadow hunter girl. She like it all of a sudden discovers this big large secret about herself and she's just rushes headlong into danger because that's who she is. And I think it, it made 
me feel by the end of the series that these characters were very, very fleshed out, which is interesting because I had just complained that I felt like they weren't fleshed out all the way, but I think in this book, I mean, it's very chunky. This is a lot of time for great character development, so I felt the character development was the strongest in this one, and this is where I did come to that conclusion that, yes, these characters are meant to be in this way, even if it is sometimes very frustrating. And I think that it's important to not have characters that act perfectly all the time because then you can explore the consequences of their actions in your book. And it was really cool to see these characters over a six book arc and see how they grow from the beginning of City of Bones to the end of City of Heavenly Fire, all that they've been through, all that they've experienced, and just seeing the conclusion of their story for now. <laughs> So I only read those three books in November and moving on to December, I finished Lair of Dreams by Libba Bray, which I did start in November on audio. This is the second book in the Diviner series. Set in the roaring 1920s, Evie O'Neill is a thoroughly modern girl who happens to live in the middle of Ohio. However, her loud personality gets her in trouble and her parents ship her off to live with her Uncle Will in New York City. Her Uncle Will is a professor of the occult and as Evie gets more involved <clears throat> in his life and in New York City, we just discover her own paranormal secrets that she has been harboring. And when a girl is brutally murdered, Evie must use these gifts to dive headfirst into these seemingly occult murders. However, this series is so much more than that. There is such a fantastic cast of characters, and especially in Lair of Dreams, we get to focus more on Ling Chan and Henry Dubois, who are dreamwalkers. A sleeping sickness is taking over New York City, where people will fall into a deep sleep and never wake up. This sleeping sickness is a malevolent force sneaking its way into the dreams of the city. Henry and Ling have the power to walk in dreams and are trying to uncover the root cause of the sleeping sickness, but they are dealing with their own problems, such as Henry's lost love and Ling's desire to fit in a, in a world that shuns her for her disabilities. Every night they escape into the dream world, but as they become more and more entangled, it becomes harder to discern what is real and what is a dream. I gave this book 4.5 out of 5 stars. I love 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 the diviners audiobooks i really think that this is a series that should be listened to although i'm sure it's fantastic reading it but wow the audiobooks are amazing the narrator is amazing i think in all of the audiobooks that i've listened to so far she is the narrator that can make the most distinct voices for each of her characters and there is such a large cast of characters so there are a lot of different voices that she needs to make but it just brings to life this 1920s atmosphere and in the creepy parts of this book because this book gets real creepy it is so chilling sometimes to listen to her narrate and i just think this book was so tender and heartbreaking we have a lot of representation which is great and i think it brings to light what it's like to be dealing with these things in the 1920s such as a disability or being lgbtq plus while also kind of being an app outcast for having these strange paranormal abilities. I loved the aspect of dreams and I think the dream world was just so like rich in metaphors and like it was a really cool setting to play around with while also trying to figure out what is going on that's causing this sleeping sickness in the city and just how the diviners came to be. There's just like this overall mystery that we get bits and pieces of throughout while dealing with this mystery of the sleeping sickness in general and it's just like building and building up throughout the whole series so i love when there's a big mystery that we only get bits and pieces of throughout the books as characters are dealing with other situations because i think it makes the payoff in the end that much sweeter i love how each of the characters struggles with their own insecurities and problems it's all very and reading about their struggles and their heartbreaks at times was just like very sad and touching and i just like adore 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 these audiobooks and i think the layer of dreams was even better than the diviners like it was just so good i should probably bump my rating up to five stars thinking about it now it was definitely five star read so i'm gonna bump it up to five stars and yeah it just like there's so many different storylines going on which i appreciate it comes together for a perfect conclusion but still like leaves on a cliffhanger because you need to know what happens in the next book and there's no release date in sight for book number four so <laughs> i need to know when that book is coming out because I need it in my life. Okay, back to the Shadowhunters. <laughs> Next, I read The Bane Chronicles by Cassandra Clare, Sarah Reese Brennan, and Maureen Johnson, which is a story short story collection focusing on Magnus Bane, the, the high warlock of Brooklyn. Magnus Bane, since he's a warlock, he's immortal, so he is a figure in basically like all of the Shadowhunters books because he's just like been around. This makes him a really good person for a short story collection to center around since all of the characters from 
back in the 1800s to present day can make appearances and so we follow stories that involve Ragnar Fell, Katerina Loss, Camille Bellacourt, Will Herondell's dad, Tessa Gray, James Herondell who we will meet in the Lost Hours, and of course the Mortal Instruments gang especially Alec and like Malik is my favorite and I feel like when I read the Bane Chronicles this is again kind of where I started to get more of an appreciation for Alex's character because with Magnus I feel like he gets a little bit more characterization. I did end up giving this book 4.25 out of 5 stars just kind of there were definitely stories that were better than others like I really enjoyed Vampire Scones and Edmund Herondel and The Midnight Air and What to Buy a Shadowhunter Who is Everything and Who You're Not Officially Dating Anyways. So basically anything that has to do with the infertile devices and anything that has to do with Malik. It was just a fun story because like Magnus is a fun guy and I really think that these short stories aren't well, this collection in general isn't essential for reading in the Shadowhunter world, but I mean like once you read all six books in the Mortal Instruments and the Infernal Devices, like you're just in too deep and you're going to want to read this anyways because you want anything you can get with these characters that you love and adore. And that's how you become trash for Shadowhunters. My Shadowhunter shelf is like already packed to the brim and Cassandra Clare has three books coming out this year. Where am I going to put all of them? So next, I continued down the road of being Shadowhunters trash and read Tales from the Shadowhunters Academy by Cassandra Clara Ceres, Brendan Marine Johnson, and Robin Wasserman. And lots of tabs on this guy. And I can't even say who the main character is because it's a big old spoiler, but you know, just like it's this guy on the cover. If you don't know who that is, just live in bliss because it's kind of a big spoiler for the end of City of Heavenly Fire, so. You know, just a warning. Don't read the description of this book like I did and spoil yourself. Oops. This short story collection takes place at the newly opened Shadowhunter Academy after the Dark War to recruit new Shadowhunters and train the young children of Shadowhunters Academies. So we have both people that are mundane but have the sight or some sort of connection to the Shadowhunter world and the elites which are children of Shadowhunter families. And so like set at this academy setting we get to kind of dive a little bit more into the backstory of the politics and prejudices that the Shadowhunters have against mundanes even though that's who they're you know are sworn to protect. And I end up giving this book five out of five stars which is very rare for a short story collection to earn a full five stars for me but this one did it this book broke me a little bit and i was definitely 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 not expecting it but it's cassandra clare so of course of course it happened this is a short story collection but it did have the cohesiveness of a full novel which i thought was great because normally you don't get that with short story collections they can be very choppy but basically we followed this main character throughout his two years in the Shadowhunters Academy. While there were different stories, maybe focusing on different side characters and stuff like that, it still follows along his path like pretty pretty consistently and it just fit very well into the flow of the story and it, it just it felt less choppy than short story collections usually do. It's cool because we do get some hints to, as to the lost hours as well as a lot of foreshadowing to the dark artifices. I would say that this book should probably be read before you dive into the dark artifices because it you you uncover some things in here that it is pretty important to the dark artifices. And I just love learning about the complicated politics of the Nephilim. Um, I definitely think that this political world is the main center in the dark artifices and so like while exploring the strained relations between Shadowhunters and Mundanes, it's very interesting to see here and that carries over into the dark artifices with the different prejudices that the Shadowhunters as a whole has. Next, I listened to Before the Devil Breaks You by Libba Bray on audio, the third book in the Diviner series. This one was five out of five stars. Following the events of the second book, there's basically a string of possessions that are occurring across New York City and it's bringing the Diviners more and more into the spotlight and our little Diviner crew is trying to figure out what the heck is happening. It was honestly a wild ride. There's so many storylines following each of these characters and just like the unexpected things happened and all of the stories are getting closer together and we're closer to discovering like who the big villain of the series is but yet we still don't know which is always like fun because you just like want to know like what is going on. 
The characters are in this book working more as a group to solve the mystery than in the last book and I like that we got to see their group dynamic and how they all play off one another with all of their different abilities because it is a wide array of abilities that they all have. I just think it's like a really well done way of having people with superpowers in like a semi-modern or slash historical setting. It's, it's really cool. And I just think that there's a lot of character growth from the first Diviner's book to Before the Devil Breaks You and yes, listen to it on audio, it's amazing. After that, I read an illustrated history of notable shadow hunters and benzenes of Downworld by Cassandra Clare, illustrated by Cassandra Dreen. It is basically like just has all these like character portraits that are pretty like very well done and you can read all about the different characters, little snippets of them, and basically I read through the whole thing so I added it on Goodreads so I could reach my goal of 100 books in 2018. And I would say if you love Shadowhunters, definitely pick this up. It's really cool. I love having faces to put to the characters when I'm visualizing the story. Don't read this if you're not done with the Mortal Instruments and the Infernal Devices because there are spoilers for those two series in here, but there are no Dark Artifices spoilers. So. Just be aware before you read through this book. And now we get to the Dark Artifices with Lady Midnight by Cassandra Clare. I love the Dark Artifices so much, so I'm so excited to talk about them finally because I finished all of the books and it was a wild ride. In the Dark Artifices, we have the Blackthorn family, which runs the Los Angeles Institute, and, and Emma Carstairs, who lives with them as Emma and Julian are Parabatai. We get introduced to their characters in City of Heavenly Fire, so you definitely need to read the Mortal Instruments and probably the Infernal Devices before you pick up this one. So yes, you have to be deep, deep in the Shadowhunters world for this series, but it's so worth it. It's so so worth it it's so good after the dark war a cold peace was instated in which the shadow hunter protection over the fairies has ended due to their involvement in the dark war and tensions are at an all-time high between the fairies and the shadow hunters when bodies of murdered humans and fairies are popping up all over la emma and the blackthorn must find the murderer for a chance at revenge and a united family. This is a book entrenched in secrets as Emma and Julian each have a big secret that they are hiding from one another that definitely breaks the laws of the shadow hunters, including the most enigmatic law of all that Parabatai are forbidden from falling in love. In Lady Midnight we get introduced to a cast of characters that I absolutely adore. Of course this book was five out of five stars. It is tabbed into oblivion because when I love a book, I just tab it up. The forbidden romance aspect of this book is just so well done. And I mean, in this whole trilogy, like the tension between Emma and Julian is that they like can't be together. Oh, it's so good. I also love the family dynamic of the Blackthorns. Each of the siblings has their own personality, very distinct, and you can just see how much they love and care for each other. And there's just a lot of horrible circumstances that have happened to Emma and the Blackthorns, their life, and like just seeing how they deal with it, how they have each other, how much they care for each other. Also, like I would die for Ty. He's one of my favorite characters in the series. I love that we had get this exploration of having an autistic character in a Shadowhunter world where autism is not something that is recognized. Like they have don't have any terms for it. They don't. They're actually forbidden from using mundane medicine. So really there's no way to figure out why Ty has this different way of interacting with the world and Julian just has just kind of as Ty's caretaker has had to figure it out as he goes along. So it's kind of cool to see an autistic character in the society of warriors and just to show that even though while they have this angel blood they are still human and deal with the variety of things that humans themselves deal with. So it's just it was a really cool aspect of the story and like throughout the series I loved his storyline and of course we get the wicked powers after queen of air and darkness coming on 2020 i don't know how or no 2022 i don't know how long i don't really know if i can wait that long because like it follows kid and ty my two favorites <sighs> anyways i also thought that this first book had a little bit of a murder mystery flair to it which is something that you don't normally see in shannon hunter's books thought it was really fun, added some layers and depth to the book that I was not expecting. And just Emma's character is just so like tough and loving and like loyal and caring and just like I love her character so so much like uh, she's just such a good main character for the series. And of course each character has such a strong voice as is typical in Cassandra Clare novels and her writing has just improved so so much over the years and she is really like 
at the top of her game right now. I also love that each of these books in the series ties into an Edgar Allan Poe poem. So I thought that that was really clever. Next is Lord of Shadows, which, hmm, this book broke me, tore my heart out of my chest, just like speechless, speechless. But yes, the political intrigue is really upped in this one and we get to see more of the strained relations between fairies and shadow hunters and extremists, radicals. It just does such a good job of talking about modern political problems, but putting them in the context of a fantasy world so that you don't necessarily know that you're reading about something that reflects our modern day political crises and it gives you like a different perspective from which to examine the situation which is just really really cool and it's great that we get that in a YA book that is still like really fun and about like demons and fairies and vampires and werewolves like it's awesome. We do get to see more of the fairylands in this book and I love 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 when Cassandra Clare goes outside of the realm of just the normal world and we go into some more fantasy worlds, it's always a good time. I just like cannot say enough how much I adore these characters and also this is the book where we get to see more of Kit. Kit is just like the perfect comic relief. He has so many funny one-liners and like I adore Kit and I cannot wait for the Wicked Powers. Again, I'm reiterating because Kit, it just is so amazing and heartbreaking and just like jam-packed with all this wonderful stuff and oh, I just love it so much. It just is such a good exploration of what could happen when people empower prey on the population's fears and how radicals can gain political power through that manipulation it's just really well done and you just like have so much hope and want so much for these characters and seeing them go through all these things that they're going through just because the characterization is so strong and you want the best for them i also love the friendship between christina and emma i just think it's such a good example of a strong female female friendship and i adore them as friends. And now moving into January. The next you would think it's Queen of Air and Darkness, but no, I took a quick break to reread The Cruel Prince by Holly Black and annotate it this time. This was my second read of the book and I did it for the Cruel Read Along live show that I did back in January in preparation for The Wicked King. I love The Cruel Prince in case you haven't known because I think I've talked about it in like so many of my videos. Jude's parents were brutally murdered when she was only seven and she was whisked away to fairy with her twin and her half fae older sister by her mother's fairy general ex-husband that was not so happy that her mother ran away and married a mortal man. As a mortal in the land of immortals, Jude yearns to earn her place in court and prove her worth. And to, to do this, as she gets drawn further into the world of political intrigues, she must discover some cruelness and wickedness of her own. Okay, five out of five stars. Again, it's just so good. These fairies are conniving and twisted and there's so many twists and turns that you do not see coming. It's fantastic. It's so, so good. Each of the characters is a different shade of morally gray. There is no right or wrong in this book and it's really um, a good exploration of morally gray characters. The plot twist at the end will like knock you off your feet and like my second time reading it, I was still shocked if that says anything to you. I knew it was coming and still I was shook when it happened. Next up, I read The Lost Sister E novella, which follows Taryn, Jude's twins, perspective during The Cruel Prince. So we get to discover what Taryn was up to during The Cruel Prince. I definitely recommend reading this before heading into The Wicked King. It's only 50 pages, but it's a really good um, indication of Taryn's character and I hate her. I'm not going to give this a rating because it is a novella and I tend not to rate novellas because I don't like think they're the same as books. Yeah, it just made me hate Taryn even more. She's the worst. That's all. So the next thing that I finished is the next audiobook I listened to, which is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Everyone hypes this book. It is worth the hype. It is so phenomenal. And I listened to it on audio and I loved it so much I had to get a physical copy of the book because it was just that fantastic. Monique Grant is a down on her luck journalist who is just scrambling for the next story when one day she's called upon by Evelyn Hugo to be the biographer of her life story. Evelyn Hugo is arguably the biggest star from the glam era of Hollywood and most famously of all she has had seven husbands. Monique listens as Evelyn tells her story making her way into Hollywood as a young girl in the 1950s all the way through her retreat from the spotlight in the 1980s and uncovers the mysteries of these seven husbands. Five out of five stars like wow. Evelyn Hugo herself feels 
larger than life and yet like she really is a real person. In the beginning we were presented kind of with this image of her as the world sees her. She's kind of this enigma, this mysterious woman that is super famous but no one quite knows all the details of her private life. And as the story progresses we get to see more and more of the real Evelyn. I think that the timelines just meld together perfectly with the present day Evelyn telling Monique the story of her life and the pacing is just really spot on. Listening to the audiobook I literally never wanted to put it down because I needed to know about the next husband. It was just, it was so, so good. I loved the glitz and glams of the 50s and 60s Hollywood, but kind of seeing underneath the surface of that. It's a really good exploration of themes of power, love, sexuality, racism, misogyny, identity, because Evelyn Hugo is a Cuban woman who is bisexual, basically in the spotlight, and we get to see the lengths that she goes to hide who she is under the pressures of Hollywood. It's just like, I don't think I have the proper words to express like how impactful and powerful this book is. One of my favorite things is when a book has like a last line that really just like punches you in the gut and this book, the last line was, was so good. It just like really, just like, it's a like final sucker punch and you're like, oh my God, this book is phenomenal. And then I read another book that broke me, which is Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare. I went to the signing for this book, so it's personalized. It's amazing. I'm gonna, just gonna try and go to Cassandra Clare signings whenever I can so that one day I will have all of my books by her signed, which is a lofty goal, but I think I can do it. Yes, the family dynamic in this book is the best. The political explorations are the best. And there are definitely some elements that are presented here that are going to come into play in the future. There is a new setting that we go to that was so intriguing and cool and really allowed to explore some interesting storylines. I love how Cassandra Clare can present so many elements that are going to play into the next book in her series and yet still give a conclusion that feels like it has wrapped up this part of the storyline. That's a really hard thing to do, I think, and she does it really well. So many ships in the series. Like, there are so many ships and I love them all. I love them all. Love all my ships. Like, I just love all these characters. It's amazing. I feel like I'm just turning into a blabbering Shadowhunter trash mess right now, but we're just gonna roll with it. I also like how we get some people from the Mortal Instruments making appearances in this book and yet they don't overpower the story. It's a good balance of having them there but not taking the focus away from the Blackthorns and Emma who this series primarily focuses on. And yeah, I just think it's, it's just very well balanced and I think it could be easy to make with all these Shadowhunters books that are available that they would feel really repetitive and yet everything is new and different and there's just so many different things that she explores in this world and it's phenomenal. Cassandra Clare just does a really, really good job of making sure each individual character's emotional arc is very nuanced and heartbreaking and yet filled with hope. It's just, there's just so many good themes and explorations in this book that I think are really important and it's, it's just phenomenal. I'm Shadowhunters trash. Yes, I am. And I'm so sad that when I finish this book, I have no more Shadowhunters books to read until the three coming out in 2019 come out. But yeah, for now, um, it's over. And it was a journey because I have been reading this entire series, starting with my reread back in June. And honestly, I'm really, really glad that I made that decision to reread the series because it was worth it. The Dark Artifices is basically probably tied with the Infernal Devices. Like they're just both really, really fantastic. As always with most Cassandra Clare books, this book was heartbreaking yet very, very hopeful. Next, I read Check Please by Ngozi Yukaza, which is a comic. I read this on the Libby app for my library, so I read it in ebook form. And we follow Biddy, who is a former figure skater, blogger, and baker, as he joins the men's hockey team at his college and he learns the world of college hockey. And it, it's just an adorable comic. The artwork is really cute and just like it made me squeal with cuteness. Five out of five stars. Like, all I have in my review is cute, 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 cute. Like, so cute. So if you like cute comics, definitely, definitely check it out. And then after I finished Queen of Air and Darkness, because apparently I have a thing for books that destroy my soul, I read The Wicked King by Holly Black, one of my most anticipated books of the year. I loved it. Sequel to The Cruel Prince. It was amazing. It was actually shorter than The Cruel Prince, which was surprising. As you can see in many, many tabs, I loved it. It is similar to The Cruel Prince in that it starts off slow, and by slow, I just mean that there's a lot of world building and exploring of what Jude is currently doing in Elfheim, kind of her 
day-to-day -day life in the court and how she operates within the court. I'm just like enamored with how topsy-turvy the world is and conniving and cruel and wicked everyone is. There's just so much to explore with each character because they are so morally gray. You're always second-guessing everyone's motivations and honestly, I'm always guessing I can never see what's gonna happen in these books. I love Jude's character so, so much. She is power hungry and she does not care who knows it. She is like just unafraid to be the like angry girl that is going for what she wants in life. And like, oh, yes, I just love it so much. And she just like learns to operate in this land of like these cruel creatures. I also love Cardin. Um, I think he's such a layered character and there is way more to him than meets the eye and because this book is told from Jude's perspective, it's first person present from Jude's perspective. We only see the other characters in this book as Jude is seeing them which is why I think the plot twists work so well because we only know Jude's perspective. We don't get to know what these other characters are up to and it, it just worked really well for the story. And it's interesting to see Cardin's character development through Jude's eyes as we, the reader, and Jude herself are trying to figure out Cardin, and it just is so good. And of course, the ending of this book murdered me, like buried me alive. How am I supposed to wait a whole year for Queen of Nothing? Like, how? I don't understand. Anxiously anticipating Queen of Nothing, and like, I need it. Does it have to be a whole year? Can it just be out now? Because. <sighs> the Wicked King, so good. Next on audio, I listened to Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. January was really the month when I started flying through audiobooks. I read so many of them because I started listening on a faster speed and I got the app Libby, which is connected to my library. So I have a plethora of books at my hands and they are all free because the library is an amazing resource. The famously wealthy Albert Ellingham believed that learning is a game. So he opened up his Ellingham Academy for amazingly gifted students and he let them come there for free of charge in the Ellingham Academy in a secluded mountain in Vermont. However, in 1936, Ellingham's wife and child are kidnapped and the only clue is a threatening letter from someone signed truly devious. The case was never solved. In modern day, Stevie Bell is a true crime aficionado who is accepted into the Ellingham Academy and when she gets there, her thesis is to solve the cold case of the Ellingham kidnappings. But things go awry when Truly Devious returns and one of Stevie's classmates ends up murdered. This was just like a really fun lighthearted mystery. I love the boarding school setting and they're just like cute and quirky and really easy to get into. Stevie was a good fit for a main character of the story as a true crime aficionado. She's trying to figure out what's going on but also there's really really good anxiety rep in the story. I felt like it was one of the best descriptions of what it feels like to have an anxiety attack and how to deal with the anxiety. I love the boarding school getting. It just makes it feel like such a classic mystery. There is also a a good weaving of the past and present mysteries into one giant mystery that I like and it left on a really really big cliffhanger so I need to get the next book so I can know what happens and I'm gonna pick up that one on audio as well because I thought the narrator did a really good job and I'm currently on hold in my library so hopefully that comes through soon. The next audiobook I listened to is My Plain Jane by oh and I am giving Truly Devious five out of five stars. The next audiobook I listened to is My Plain Jane by Cynthia Han, Jody Meadows, and Brody Ashton. And all you really need to know about this is it's a Jane Eyre retelling with ghosts and ghost hunters. That just like kind of sets the tone. It's a really fun, quirky retelling. I thought it was hilarious. I love the audiobook because the British accents I think really make the story, so I would recommend listening to it on audio. I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. I thought it was really cute and fun and it was a good way to refresh on what actually happened in Jane Eyre because I did read that like forever ago. And I loved like the commentary on the story of Jane Eyre itself and just like kind of like the self-aware comments that the authors make throughout the book. It was it was just like there was such a cute friendship and center of this between Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre herself and like it was just it was just a fun time quirky cute fun if you're looking for a light-hearted wacky paranormal historical YA book this is the book for you next up I read Amber and Dust by Lyra Selene which was the Owl Crate book of December. Sylvie has the power to wield illusions, which is seen as a curse in the Dusklands where she lives. So she seeks out the glittering palace of the Amber Empress to make use of her talents and 
or new place in her court, she must take on a new name, Mirage, and navigate the treacherous games of the court. And I'm giving this book 3.5 out of 5 stars. The writing is very lush and magical and rich, which lends really well to the world building because the glittering palace is like this, like very lush and rich place. I think that the lyrical prose can get a little bit heavy handed at times, but I like flowery writing, so it didn't detract too much from the story for me. Sylvie is definitely a flawed character. She thirsts for power and has all this ambition, and yet she's like a little bit entitled, and it's, it is addressed in the story as it goes along, and as she like learns that it's not so easy to just waltz into the court and have a place there and how cutthroat it actually is. And I thought her character arc was interesting because she's clearly meant to be a flawed character. I think the side characters could have used more development, especially the Amber Empress. With her, I felt like her character was more show than tell. It, it just felt like a very classic YA book, like a fun guilty pleasure to read about. I always love reading about when girls with powers try to infiltrate the court powers, stuff like that. So it was fun and I will probably continue on with the series when the next book is released. Next, I listened to The Female of the Species by Mindy McGinnis on audio and again, a phenomenal audiobook, like life-changingly phenomenal audiobook. Alex's sister was brutally murdered three years ago and so Alex took matters into her own hands. She did what she had to do and exacted revenge when the law was not enough. Alex knows her dark nature and knows that she cannot be trusted around others. She's an outcast, yet she befriends PK and grows closer to Jack. That sets these three teenagers on a collision course that will change their lives forever. Five out of five stars. I think it's one of the most impactful stories that I have ever read. It just does such a great exploration of rape culture, slut shaming, and sexism. Seeing Alex's emotional development throughout the story was just like so, so good. And it's like dark and unflinching, but it has such a powerful message. And the ending left me in tears and I walked away from the book not being able to stop thinking about it. And I'm still thinking about it to this day and that's how I know that it was a really phenomenal book. To end the month of January, I read Queens of Fenburn and Two Dark Reigns by Kendar Blake. In the Three Dark Crown series, we are transported to the island of Fenburn where three triplet queens must compete for the crown and the winner that kills their sisters is crowned queen. Each sister has a different power and when they turn 16, they must begin the fight to the death. Queens of Fenburn is a novella bind up where we follow the triplets when they were young and we learn more about what they were like when they were all together up until the age that they were taken to the separate families on the island. We look at the legend of the Oracle Queen who is said to just have gone crazy and killed everyone and that's why oracles are no longer welcome as queens on this island. And we get to take a look at the legend and see how history is truly written by the winners. I did not rate this because I'm not really trying to rate novellas these days, but it was definitely fun and added layers to the world building of the Three Dark Crowns world. And Two Dark Reigns, I ended up giving 4.5 out of 5 stars. It was my favorite in the series so far. I think in the past, I felt like the history of the world and some of the world building elements were lacking. I think that this book starts to make up for that. We get more of the world building, more of the legend and lore in this really just like dark and mysterious world. And these books have always taken some unexpected turns and gone in directions that I did not anticipate them going in. I also just think I'm really bad at guessing plots, but anyways, that's besides the point. But yeah, I really loved the direction of this book and the things that happened. I particularly enjoyed Arsenault's chapters. I think that it those are the chapters that filled in the knowledge gaps in the world building. But it's just so cool to see like the strife between these three sisters and this matriarchal society where everyone is like fighting to the death for the throne and it just explores this like really unique family dynamic. I do not know the direction that the last book will take but it is called Five Dark Fates which is awesome and the cover was just revealed. It is beautiful and I believe that this is dropping in September and I cannot wait to see the finale of this series because I just like don't know like how it's gonna end and that's how I like it. All right, that was a doozy. That was in many books. I think that was 22 books in total. So yes, that was my catch up wrap up and hopefully next time I do a wrap up, I won't have 22 books because my throat is dry. If you've read any of these books, please let me know what you thought of them in the comments and please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Have some fun, read some books, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Oh.